did you have fears about like quote unquote coming out as sober and you know like was there a reveal to your friends like was it like nerve-wracking were they supportive what were your your reaction and their reactions yeah i mean there was definitely a fear there was i i like looking back when i came out as came out as sober i'm doing air quotes whatever you know the terminology is it was like my friends were like oh finally <laughs> like she's you know recognizing this um I, it seemed like i was the last to know that i had a drinking problem i guess but yeah there was a lot of fear i didn't want to i didn't want people to see me in a different way like i remember when i first stopped drinking i didn't really tell anyone and and even when i did tell people i just kept doing the same things that i was always doing like kept going to bars kept didn't change any of my social plans because i didn't want people to see me as like boring cuz that's like what the stigma around sobriety is is that you're boring um especially in college and so there was definitely a fear the coming out the first people that i came out to or like told that i was sober was my two roommates because it was covid and they were coming back um we had all gone home for a little bit and then they were coming back you know when school was like kind of starting up again and they were you know decently big drinkers and so i knew that i wasn't going to be able to like tell any more lies cuz up to that point i was like lying like oh i'm just not feeling it or i just don't want to drink and i knew like living with these people for you know 6 months to a year more and having to lie the whole time wasn't going to be great so i just told them and then they reacted you know, very well to it. So after just telling them, it was so much easier to tell other people. Um, and a lot of times, like same with like going to um, events sober, like the anticipation of it is so much worse than actually doing it. So just, you know, telling them and then seeing how well they reacted gave me the confidence to do it for other people in my life or to tell other people in my life. 100%. I could totally relate. I was on fake antibiotics. I still, I yep. still like, I still am not fully upfront with some people because it, it mm -hmm. is just kind of, it is like personal in a way. Mm -hmm. It's also like kind of embarrassing. There's like a stigma to it. Yeah. I wonder, do you think there is a difference in terms of, for it is for girls and guys and men and women, at least, especially like the college level? Because mm -hmm. I feel like while men's mental health is starting to come around, I feel like, you know, girls have always kind of been like, put your mental health first and stuff. Do you think there is a difference there? Totally. And I'm glad to bring this up because every other podcast I've been on has been with a woman. So we can just like relate to each other in that way. But I definitely think like just being vulnerable yeah it's something that women i think are more prone to do and it's more expected of women and it's not as expected of men um not just with sobriety but with a lot of things and i think too just the stereotypical men culture of like beer football and you know shooting pool or like whatever mm -hmm. yeah it's just so ingrained in that culture like your man cave or something and again these are all like stereotypical you know binary man things but um mm. i think like even my boyfriend he's been so supportive and he has naturally just like decreased his drinking not because he ever had an issue with it but first it was in support of me and now he just like doesn't feel the need to drink because he sees like how well i'm doing without it and he just i don't know he's just more into like health and wellness now um but he's gotten like backlash from a couple of his friends of just like like, like they know me, they know my story, they know that I'm sober, and yet they still give him backlash for like him not drinking. So I think that brings up the point too of like, if you cut, like, it's almost like you have to tell people I have a problem with alcohol for them to fully grasp accept it and it. like understand yeah. it and accept it. Whereas if it's just like, oh, it's, I don't really enjoy it, then people are more, they're just more likely to be hard on you and like, you're more likely to receive backlash, I feel like, which sucks that you have to like try and convince people of how bad your problem is to in order for them to take you seriously. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely. So for me, I was definitely, I came back to Syracuse for alumni weekend. And if you saw me at a bar, I, that was a diet Coke or water, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, I, you know, I'm a bigger guy. I would go to the pregame and I would just like, palm an olipop or something or just Mm -hmm. like a lacroix Mm -hmm. or something and you know at times well yeah but it's it's also kind of like cowardice in the fact that i was too pussy to fucking just be like yeah i'm not boozing Mm -hmm. guys you know so it it was just kind of tough and even now like some of my friends get it but some of them didn't like i don't know if they like interpreted it as like a break or something but like i had a friend call me at the bar a few nights ago being like, dude, we're so wasted. They're five dollar like well shots, dude. Five dollar century twenty one shots. I was like, Oh, sick. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like I know they're try- not trying to be like dick. I just don't think they like get it. But I I haven't been as forthcoming with it as, you know, mm-hmm. others. But it's definitely tough from a guy's perspective. If I can Yeah, and it. with like I know you've talked about like fraternity culture, like that, just that mm-hmm. especially is like so, so toxic yeah. in terms yeah. of drinking. And just like if, like going back to Syracuse for alumni weekend, you've made all these friends in college that know you as, you know, Justin the drinker. And so mm-hmm. to go back and like say you're not going to drink or show them this completely different version of you, which is, you know, in reality, as we both know, the true you or like the real you. I didn't try to punch any of them this time. Yeah, (laughs) it'll it'll take them a bit of time. It'll throw them off guard. It's almost like you have to get to know the person again. So I don't think there's anything wrong with like not feeling up to telling people right away. Like Mm -hmm. I and I also think that you can have different things that you tell to different people in your life. Like if you know, like I know that there's some friends in my life who, yeah, I can tell them the full story and they're going to be super supportive and understanding. I also know there's some friends in my life who are never going to get it. And so Mm -hmm. I tell them a different story. Obviously mine's a little different because I'm so open about it that everyone can just go on YouTube and see my full story. But you know, in the beginning I did tell certain people certain things. Like I don't think Mm -hmm. you have to tell everyone everything, you know? Yeah. It's definitely it's definitely not the most comfortable subject, especially yeah. and it's not very like, uh, you know, some people definitely reacted a lot better than others. And no one really gave me too much like shit. I feel mm-hmm. like because they saw like mm-hmm. I'm I'm like a lot better than I was, you know, mm-hmm. and I just don't feel it, it is just kind of this goes down to like a little bit later. But you you and I kind of are really like bucking the trend of getting wild in your 20s is -hmm. there a sense i sometimes feel a little left out not gonna lie like Mm -hmm. do you Mm -hmm. yeah i still feel fomo like halloween especially always gets me it's like these past three years like Mm -hmm. halloween for some reason has always gotten like i stay off social media because it just yeah it's a drinking holiday when you're in your 20s and I definitely know the feeling of like, oh, I'm in my 20s. Like, I need to be living it up in my 20s. Mm. I'm missing out. But at the same time, what I've tried to encourage myself and others who bring this same concern with to me is it's okay to feel left out. But at the same time, like, who said that living it up in your 20s meant getting wasted every weekend and not, True. you know, remembering your weekends? To me now, when I think of like what quote unquote living it up means, like it's having genuine conversations with people and like doing things I enjoy. Like you started a freaking podcast because you wanted to do it. Like I started a YouTube channel. Like it's just doing things that you love and who cares like what other people think. Like to me, that's now what I view as living it up, not drinking into oblivion and like you know causing complete chaos in my life and in my relationships so just like reframing how i view what the 20s are for has helped a lot hell yeah i would never have started this if i was still drinking and i would not be like working out or meditating or any so Mm -hmm. no why you know so completely agree like it is you just got to remind yourself of like how much better off you are without it Mm -hmm. and that might Mm -hmm. be tough for some people to admit you know and do you believe in i'm an extremist but do you believe that there is moderation like truly like 
Yeah, I, like I, I, I don't really envy people. Like I kind of used to who could like drink and like have fun and like be normal. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, there are plenty of people with like pretty good relationships with alcohol. Can yeah. someone have a good relationship with alcohol in your opinion? I, in my opinion, like part of me wants to say no, you know, like mm -hmm. the, the part of me that can't drink wants to say no, no one can have a healthy relationship with alcohol because if I can't have it, no one else can have it. Like that's exactly. what I want to say. But at the same time, it's confusing because then I'll see people like my partner who can have one or two drinks with his friends every three months and like be fine. Or I have another, you know, girlfriend who we're at like we were be, be out at the bar and she would stop when she felt tipsy. Like she only wanted to get to that point and not go past it. So I see people doing that. But I don't know. I, I heard this one thing in a podcast once about, you know, if like if you tell someone I'm going to remove alcohol from your life forever. If that makes you even a little bit uncomfortable, then chances are you're at least emotionally attached to it. You know, maybe you're not physically dependent on it, but if if the idea of removing it from your life makes you uncomfortable, there's something attached there, you know, emotions or just because you've been doing it for a while. Um that said, like I do I do think moderation is possible for some people, but for like people like me like I don't really I don't know if I identify as an alcoholic like I don't know what I want to identify as I don't know if I want to put a label on it but I do know that I have a chemical imbalance where I like can't stop after one drink so I know moderation will never ever ever be a thing for me and that was just proven by my relapse like two months ago I thought I could have like a glass of wine um, and ended up just the feeling after two years of sobriety the feeling came right back of like no like I want more and that's how I knew like nothing had changed. So for me, I know moderation is impossible for some people. A very select few, I feel like it it is. What do you what do you think about that? Uh I don't know. I'm the type of guy where it's like my parents have Halloween. No no kids came around for Halloween anymore. So mm -hmm. we just have a bunch of fucking M and M's uh mm -hmm. and like Snickers staring at me. And I've been mm -hmm. good. Like not that it's just it's not I don't want to like say good because I haven't had any because that's fucked up, but mm -hmm. I've been good that I haven't had the whole fucking bag because I fucking mm -hmm. want to and it stares at me after breakfast. Are you kidding me? After mm -hmm. breakfast, I used to have peanut M&Ms, junior and senior year, my roommate, it was so <laughs> fucked up. I would literally steal his peanut M&Ms and he would be like, dude, you got to like pay for it. I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I am such a dickhead for that, but I, I like, I'm just like, I wouldn't, you know, exactly. I don't identify as an alcoholic or an addict per se you know i'm watching dope sick right now i'm a little late but mm. great show mm. the, those are addicts you know those are like they are homeless they like need it like it is 10 out of 10 they think they're gonna die without it mm -hmm. like i can make it through a day you know a little bit knock on wood just fine without a drink and i don't really find myself craving that much right now but i can't just have beer if I have a beer, I'm going to have 50. I'm going to have like, you know, not mm -hmm. 50 in that night, but it's like, can't just have a drink. I can't just have a cookie. I'm going to have four at least, you know? Yeah. And I want to yeah. find that place with food a little bit more because at least like, you know, I want to live a little um, mm -hmm. and find that good place with food. Whereas drinking, I just feel so much better without it. And I'm kind of at peace with the fact that I can't. I also feel like, it's kind of with you, this is going to sound so corny, but it's kind of like a power in a way. And it's mm -hmm. like a differentiator, you know, it's like you're different, you know, it, it, you can just follow the trend of just drinking just like everyone else. But that was just getting me nowhere, you know, and why, why fit in for you? You know, that was a little bit of a rant there, but yeah, no, I, I agree. And going back to your point of like, dope sick i haven't seen that show but mm -hmm. i think that like just in the steady sunday meetings i hear a lot of people talking about the all or nothing mentality now that it's not alcohol like you said it's it's candy or it's for me it's like my business like i'll be the first to admit that i'm like addicted essentially to this business and like just working on it i could work on it all the time like i can't you know moderate 
how much I like work on this and productivity and all of that. So I think, you know, it's a lot of us who struggle with alcohol, maybe not everyone, but some people have that perfectionistic, like all or nothing mentality, which is why we sometimes struggle to have just one drink. But at the same time, going back to your comment of like, okay, those people are addicts. I think that's where sometimes we get into trouble where it's like, that is what people think of when they think of an alcoholic or an addict, the person under the bridge, you know, scratching, like they can't survive without it. But that's one of the reasons why, like, I am so open about it because I do have an addictive personality. Maybe I'm an addict. Like I, sometimes I think I am like, if something will make me feel good or differently, I'll abuse it. You know, it's happened with Adderall. It's happened with other drugs. So like I identify as that. And that's why I think like my content maybe has impacted people because they're like, oh, this blonde white girl, sorority girl can be addicted to something. You know, it's not just the person under the bridge. Like there's this whole gray area where I think people are like, if I'm not like that, then I don't have a problem. But there's the area in between of like, okay, you, you maybe you're not under a bridge, but you have all of this you, it's not serving you. It's not, mm -hmm. you're still not drinking in a healthy way. And that's where we get into trouble is when we, it's so black and white where it's like, either you have a problem or you don't. I don't necessarily agree with like, you know, having a problem where you don't, I think you can fall somewhere in the middle, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, I honestly, like, I couldn't agree more. Like there is like that, mm -hmm. you know, blurred line. Like realistically, if I was still drinking, I would be looking for jobs. I hate, um, I, wouldn't have this podcast, I'd be, my health would be a lot worse. I literally have damaged my health for alcohol. You know, I literally did not stop drinking. I put drinking over the health of my esophagus. You know, I've literally fucking ruined my gut health kind of for drinking. I'm starting to get it back a little bit. But fucking no bush light is worth that. You know, that's, uh, yeah, my little spiel. Yeah, no. Stomach health, I like had stomach issues for years and I never understood why. And mm -hmm. then I was like, oh, it's tofu. <laughs> it's dairy. <laughs> it's like yeah. all these things. And then I stopped drinking and it all went away. Not just saying yeah. that's going to happen to everyone, but it, yeah, yeah, it tears. Your... You're right. I would drink till and I threw right. up. Yak and rally. Are you yeah. kidding me? All the time. There's a time sophomore year, uh, junior year. I was like throwing up a few times a week and mm -hmm. like having Advil like twice a day, every day. Do you know, like I've just fucking took years off my life doing that shit, you know? And it's yeah. like, why? And I, I, I don't know. Why do you think, why is it, you know, just go like macro here. Why is it, especially college kids, we both went to kind of like college -y, like typical schools. Why is drinking culture, I'm going to sound like such a nerd here, but why is drinking culture like what it is, really? What do you, why do you think? I'm not asking you to be a philosopher here, but a little bit. I mean, I, I think it just has been perpetuated and no one has questioned it. Like, you know, our parents drank in college, mm -hmm. like our parents were doing keg stands and it, it has just continued because like I always think about you know when you're if you're a sober person and you're in a group of drinkers you're obviously going to feel alienated and isolated because you're not doing the thing that they're all doing same if you're a drinker in a group of sober people and you're like the only one who's drunk I mean maybe if you're drunk you're not going to realize it but you're you're, you're going like, to be fuck you little losers angry. fuck you yeah <laughs> and so I just think that like I when any inkling of like me having a potential drinking problem in high school was just washed away my freshman year, especially because everyone was drinking that way. And I think it's a combination of, you know, I just talked to someone on a Instagram live about this, about how it's a combination of going to college. If you're going to like your traditional four year university where you're like go away from your parents for the first time and you have access to Greek life 
and you have access to older people who can buy you alcohol and, you know, little supervision, not to mention like campuses aren't really doing much to combat the issue. And so I think it's, it's a combination of all that and then just the fact that when you're so in that culture and it's so normalized and binge drinking is so normalized and waking up at 8 a.m. on the weekend to drink in the front yard is like a normal thing to do, you're not going to think anything else that you're doing is abnormal. Like some of those things I'm sure you've seen and I've seen in college now I'm like that's so fucked up. But in the moment I was like that's funny. So it's like it's just a perspective thing i think you're just like in that lifestyle there's one way and it's like unless you hop off and i just Mm -hmm. i don't know about you i didn't want to do have to do this in 10 years you know i figured do something about it now that's why i'm 22 you know so i'm young i didn't want to be 30 and have legitimate problems i have fucking duis and like yeah Like same, same for me where I knew I had an issue with alcohol. Like once I realized, okay, alcohol can't be a part of my life forever. Like there's just no way. Then I had to realize, okay, it's either a matter of me dealing with it now or I can deal with it in five years, 10 years, 15 years. But you know, the longer I wait, the more shit's going to happen, you know, the more harm I'm doing to myself and my relationships. And I think that was like the mental switch that I need to make to be like, okay, it's going to happen at some point. So I why not do it now and I think only you know that deep down of like if you know in your heart and chances are if you're listening to this like if you know in your heart that alcohol is not going to be a part of your life forever for whatever reason if it's an unhealthy relationship that you have with it and you're using it in an unhealthy way yeah it's just a matter of time so like for both of us it was like why not now like why not get ahead of it which is not an easy decision to make that doesn't mean it was like oh we're going to stop. And then for me, at least I wasn't, I didn't just stop. Like it took a while, but making that decision to like embark on the sobriety journey was the most important part to like do it now rather than waiting. So I, yeah, I agree with you there. What's it like to be vulnerable on the internet? It's freeing in one way, but it's fucking scary in another way. It's so scary. Like today I literally had a breakdown um, for <laughs> this. Every single time I post a YouTube video. I've been posting videos now for two years, which, you know, isn't that long. But still, to this day, I get anxious when I hit publish Mm -hmm. because and then and then or a TikTok or something. And then after I post it, I'm like, okay, I need to actually delete it and edit this out so that like in my last TikTok, I talked about how I had a drinking issue at age 17. And then I was like, well, what if someone comes to me because I was underage drinking? (laughs) And it's just I think it's just normal to feel that way when you're putting yourself out there online and being vulnerable. But at the same time, the thing that I always come back to and remember is like, if you can help just one person, then that's enough for me. And like the messages that I'll receive, and I'm sure you'll be receiving too, if you haven't already about how this podcast has helped them or how, you know, my YouTube has helped them. That's what makes it all worth it. Cause like you and I went on YouTube looking for people to relate to, being that person for someone is so great. And yeah, it's scary to admit and to like talk about all the shit that I did when I was, you know, fucked up. But at the same time, like I know I'm helping people and we are literally on a floating rock in space. Mm-hmm. This is the only, you know, whatever floating you believe. Flat rock, only- floating flat rock. <laughs> there you go. Floating it's actually, flat it's floating rock. upwards. It's floating upwards. It's <laughs> yeah. like a plate. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like if you can't like, I don't know, sometimes I'll get like, oh, it's just social media. Like our parents' parents would laugh at the things that we find important. But at the same time, like this is what's happening now. This is how we connect. And like it or not, like this is probably the future for the next however long. So why not take advantage of it and do what you want to do? Like you and I both already made the decision to stop drinking and face the backlash of that. And I think that kind of prepared me for any backlash and gave me a thicker skin for any backlash that I might face with my YouTube or with, you know, my content and stuff. Um, And yeah, like I'm already, I already, you know, don't really fit in with a lot of my friends who drink. So who cares? (laughs) Like I'm just going to do this. 
Um, but yeah, I, it's tough sometimes. Is it kind of tough? Cause I still am. I still talk in my frat group chat all the time. I don't want this or this episode or like anything I said here to fucking alienate them, you know? And it's like, uh, I, you know, I still want to be included. And just cause I'm not staying up all night, you know, like drinking 20 beers and like fucking staying until five, staying up till five. I don't want to not be a part of that. I've kind of been like, I've gone back to Syracuse twice now and it's like, I'm like, go out, but bars suck to be honest. Mm. Is going out weird? Cause it sucks to me. I, it's just standing around it. I don't like it. Yeah. I like, I, I relate to what you said about like, Oh, you don't want to, you still want to be involved in the, in your, with your fraternity friends. You still want to be invited. Like I'm the same way. Like I want to be invited, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> like most of the time I'm going to say no. And that's just because like when you're, I think when you're first getting sober and making this life change, you think that you're going to, okay. Like at least for me, I was like, I'm still going to do everything that I used to do. I'm still going to go to the bars and prove to people that I can be this fun, sober person. Like I'm not the boring, sober person. But then I would go to the bars and like you said, it would suck. It's sweaty. People are like breathing on you. They reek. So yeah, I don't go out. <laughs> I really don't ever. I can't remember the last time I went out. And if I told you that like three years ago that I didn't go out when I was 24 years old living like near San Francisco, I would have thought you're crazy. Mm -hmm. But that's just my life now. I would rather be home. I would rather like go to a movie. I would rather like cook dinner. I would literally rather do anything than go out. And that took a while for me to realize, but that's, yeah. That's just I do, ju I, I relate, trust me, but I still just have, and I had it when I was drinking. I just felt like a bum kind of on the nights and it, mm -hmm. I'm a totally mm -hmm. get sucked in the snap stories and, yeah. it's, you know, and the Instagrams the day after and it's like, oh, fuck. That looked fun. Yeah. And obviously it always yeah. looks better yeah. through the phone, but. I do. I still feel that way. But the thing is, I only feel that way. I only think like, oh, I wish I could do that if I was still drinking. Like, I don't wish that I was there as a sober person. I just wish I was there as someone who could handle my alcohol and drink like normal, you know, quote unquote normal with my friends. Um. But yeah, the FOMO sucks. Like it is hard seeing your friends going out and obviously making all these memories that you'll never get to experience or that you won't ever like get the inside jokes on. Um, and I do feel like sometimes now my friends are even like hesitant about even telling me about their nights out because they don't want me to feel left out or triggered. So then I really don't like get the in on what they're doing sometimes and yeah, I I have this thing where sometimes I'll like view myself from how someone else would view me. So like if I'm sitting on the couch on a Friday night watching a movie and someone else sees me doing that and thinks I'm lame, then I like internalize that and I'm like, oh, I'm this sucks. Like I'm a bum. I'm lame. So, yes, I do feel that way. Like it, there's there's definitely those types of weekends, but just making other like fun plans where you, you literally can't look at your phone cause you're doing something else has really helped. Um, yeah. Totally, totally agree. Any advice to someone who's maybe just like wants to take a night off of drinking and not get shit, like any advice to, or if you're like, Hey, I'm going to a concert or anything, anything that's like drinking centric. Cause uh, be, yeah. until like now I'm starting to phase back into it but yeah. I like I just couldn't imagine going to a Cubs game from Chicago it's like that is your it's a drinking day with the Cubs in the background yeah. and like my cousin invited me to go downtown and I would have I would have loved to and this was like two weeks into being sober and I was on antibiotics sorry George I wasn't yeah but uh <laughs> Like, I don't know, any advice for like these like really tough, you're there to drink situations? Do you avoid them entirely? Any advice to, you know, even if you, yeah, even if you're not looking to not drink long term, any advice on how to get through events like that? Yeah, I, that's a good question. That's funny you say that about baseball. We were just talking in a meeting about how like this one girl lives in Houston and, it is just World um, Series. Party, yeah. Yeah, party yeah. central right now. Like it's not even about the baseball. It's just about the 
drinking and the partying. Yeah, sporting events are definitely like still triggering. Like I, I just went to uh, like the Cal Berkeley game because I live near there, and it there was you know beers served everywhere, and like yeah, it's definitely triggering. I would say, I would say like I did go to a Giants game one time, and they had one non-alcoholic beer across the stadium. I like was out of my seat for probably forty-five minutes trekking to like get that non-alcoholic beer. But once I got, I spent like twelve dollars or something on it, like a Heineken zero point zero. But once I got back to my seat, and like my sister was with me and two of her friends, they were all drinking their beers, and I had my Heineken or my you know non-alcoholic Heineken. It just I felt more in the mix. So like anything you can do to sometimes it's the placebo effect, like just having a drink of some kind, whether it's a non-alcoholic, you know, drink, if that's not triggering for you or a mocktail or just a Sprite or something. Shirley Temple is my go to now. And just being able to hold that or have it near you and being able to sip on it while while your friends are sipping on their like alcoholic beverages, just anything to make you feel less alienated. Um, Because if you're sipping on water or you're not sipping on anything at all, you're that's just an easy way to for me to like feel like I stand out. Um, so that's like one thing I would say. The other thing is just like this is kind of cliche, but really absorbing where you're at. Like concerts, yeah. I never went to a concert sober, even in high school. Like we used to go to these underground dingy concerts and the only reason we go is to drink we didn't even barely knew the artist and now when I go to concerts or festivals I've definitely discovered there's certain things like a three-day festival I went to my first sober one last year and it was just not for me like I think I could go maybe one day but going there and like being able to listen to the music or like experience the sports game and fully remember it and like be involved in that was what made it worth it to me to go sober and now also I used to think sorry I'm kind of going on a tangent here but I used to think I was a boat person I went on a boat sober with my friends and I am not a boat person (laughs) but when I I fucking hate boats (laughs) when I was drinking I was so I didn't realize that I didn't like boats. So not drinking at events can actually make you realize what you actually like to go to and what you maybe only like to go to because you're drinking, which obviously anything can be made a drinking event. Um, But back to your question about just like if someone wants to take a night off from drinking, yeah, just be fully in the moment and just remember that you will never regret a night where you didn't drink. Like I've never woken up and been like, oh, I wish I drank last night. Like I'm always happy that I didn't drink. I'm always happy to have, yeah, just happy to have not drank and be clear headed in the morning is what I would say. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, you mentioned non-alcoholic beer and honestly, that's something that I am kind of a little fearful of in a way, just worried it's going to enter the brain waves and kind of tickle the wrong sensors. Does it, it does not bother you. Does it bother you? Uh, what do you think? Well, 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 well. So I don't really like beer. Okay. So I was a, I was a beer guy. You know? The only reason I drank that non-alcoholic beer was because I f- was feeling triggered and just thought it would make me feel more like it would help me fit in, which it did. Um, but yeah, I definitely think it's a slippery slope sometimes with non-alcoholic beers. And like for me, I drank to get drunk. I did not drink because I enjoyed the taste of alcohol. Like, I didn't give two craps about what the drink tasted like. If it had the most alcohol, like, I was drinking it. And so, for me, it wasn't like, oh, I really like this cocktail because it tastes good. So, I'm going to go buy the non-alcoholic gin to make Ugh, a gin like and tonic. Gross. Like, it, it, I don't like the taste of alcohol. Like, I only drank it to get drunk so for me like that would be super triggering if i was drinking something that tasted like gin but wasn't gin like that doesn't make sense to me i get that some people need that in their recovery um for me that wouldn't work that wouldn't work for me but i think it's all about just finding what works for you and you know if you want to try Like, if you know in the back of your mind that this non-alcoholic beer is probably going to be triggering, then it likely will be. So probably avoid it. But if you don't know, 
I don't think there's a harm in trying it in a safe space, maybe telling someone that you're going to try it and, you know, see how it affects you. Um, same with like non-alcoholic wines. I tried one once and it tasted just like juice because, you know, it doesn't have the kick that yeah. alcohol has. So, yeah. and I didn't enjoy wine. I only drank it to get drunk. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's where I stand on non-alcoholic beverages. Yeah. I don't really like miss the taste of beer and mm -hmm. I just, I just would rather not because it's just too close to me. I just know it's going to be way too close. And it's going to like, it, the spidey senses are going to kick mm -hmm. in. And I, I just rather would like take the path less traveled. Like I've honestly like, like I've kissed my girlfriend when she's been drinking and it's like gone down my yeah. liver. I'm like, mm -hmm. mom, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't know. <laughs> I just get like fucking nervous now. I don't know. Alcohol like yeah. scares me now where it's like, I don't want to like break it. Yeah. Yeah, and beer it beer especially. Yeah. Non alcoholic beer especially, I think, tastes so much like beer that it's scary. Mm -hmm. Whereas like other things, I haven't tried any of like the spirits or anything, so I don't know how much they taste like an actual spirit. But yeah, beer I think the beer especially really tastes like beer. Got it. Got it. We got about uh ten minutes left. So I want okay. to touch base. First of all, you need a podcast yourself. Are you kidding me? Like you are such a natural <laughs> at this stuff. Come on. Like it's literally, it's like, it's like 40 bucks a month. You know, if you do like, if you get the premium, it could be free, but like you need to like splurge on some stuff. Dude, yeah. why are you not doing this? You're like perfect. I, I want, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I want to, I just have, I feel like so much happening right now. I'm just mm -hmm. trying to find the time, but yeah, when I do, You'll be my guest. Hey, there we go. There we go. All right. So you mentioned your meetings, Steady Sunday. Tell people yeah. about what happens in these meetings. Tell people how they could join, all that good stuff. Yeah. So Steady Sunday was recently rebranded. It used to be called Steph Sober Squad, but I decided to, well, okay. First, going back to what we talked about in the beginning, it was the Fun Shit Squad. Again, right. name didn't really make sense. <laughs> um, made sense in my head, but not to a lot of other people. So we switched it to Steph Sober Squad. Actually, first it was the Young and Sober Squad. Then there was also an AA meeting called the Young and Sober Squad, and people were getting confused. So I switched it to Steph Sober Squad. Um, then I, when I finally decided that I was really going to commit to this and try and grow this and help as many people as possible, I didn't want to have my name in it just because I've heard horror stories from like friends who've tried to start, like one of my friends tried to start a business and had her name in it and she just wasn't getting investors and things. Cause they're like, who the heck is blank? Um, not saying I'm like, you know, trying to get investors or anything, but I just didn't want to have my name attached to it because it's also so much more than just me at this point. Like we have different hosts and, um, everyone who comes to the meetings are truly what make them what they are. So that's why we decided to rebrand to Study Sunday. Um, and the idea behind that is just, you know, how do you feel when you wake up on a Sunday or any day when you're, when you're not hungover? You feel steady, rooted in who you are. You feel calm uh, most of the time. So that's where that name come from came from. But um, yeah, we have three meetings a week. They're an hour each. Usually there you can check in with a group of people who understand what you're going through. Um, we do like highs and lows. So you'll say like a high from your week and a low something you struggled with. And it's just a chance for people to talk and get advice in a very open, um, safe and non judgmental community where Again, you don't have to label yourself. You don't even have to be fully sober to join. You can be sober curious. Um, you can be just like slightly questioning your relationship with alcohol. I think that's what makes it unique is that there's all these different perspectives. And through coming to the meetings, a lot of people have said that they that's how they've come to the realization, oh, maybe I do want to do this for like the long run or maybe I don't need to. So it can just help you in, with that decision. Um but yeah, to join, you would just go to steadysunday.com slash meetings and you can sign up through there. There's a It's membership based, so you don't have to pay. I never want to like close it off to anyone who can't afford to pay. Um, I want to make it you know as accessible as possible. So there's always a free option. But if you wanted to support the group, help grow the meeting, support me, um, there's an option to pay as well. 
Um, and then in addition to like the check-in meetings, we also have different events. So like this meeting, we have a journaling workshop coming up um, and we have a topic focused meeting about the holidays and holiday triggers. So there's just various events hoping to expand also to like guest speakers or in-person events maybe one day. But um, yeah, that's kind of the background on that. Awesome. Yeah. And totally from my perspective, mm-hmm. you know, knowing that you're not you when you decide to go sober or stop drinking f- when you're below the age of 40 you feel like you're the only person in the world doing it mm-hmm. or that you're going to turn into a total complete loser and that's just mm-hmm. not the case realistically mm-hmm. so steph a great resource youtube tiktok instagram where final question what's like the, what's the goal what's the end goal with all this what are you- <laughs> Ah, the end goal, just because I write my goals in my journal every morning, (laughs) is to help as many people as possible, make a sober resource as as accessible to as many people as possible so that they never have to feel as alone as I did um, in college when I was wrestling with this decision. And selfishly, just to create a life that I love doing what I love, you know, this is what I enjoy doing. I enjoy creating content and running these meetings and hearing other people's stories and connecting with people that way. So um, just looking to be able to work for myself while doing this. There That's kind of the goal. Awesome. Steph. All right. So Instagram, steady dot Sunday. And then yes. Steph M still. Yes. And then, On Instagram and TikTok. Those are like my TikTok. personal and yeah. then Stephanie still YouTube Steph I would love to have you back on there's so yeah. much stuff we could talk about whatever I would be, happily come on your show keep doing like keep doing what you're doing you're killing it there we go <laughs> thanks so are you I'll come back anytime there thank you go. for having me this was fun